Uh, hey guys, so uh, it's three o'clock now, so we'll get started with our lecture. Uh, hey, I'm Adam. And I'm Anj. Uh, we're both uh, officers of Math Club at South. We do competition math in high school. We've also done competition math in middle school. Uh, we just like to share some of the things we've learned over the past few years with you guys. Uh, some tricks that will help you guys uh, with your own uh, career in competition math. So uh, brief and, uh, so our lecture today is about uh, sequences and series. So we'll start with arithmetic sequences and series. We'll do a few example problems with that. Uh, after that, we'll do geometric sequences and series and a few example problems related to that. And towards the end, we'll do some harder uh, challenge questions uh, that don't all fall under arithmetic sequences or geometric sequences. They may have some harder patterns. So if you want uh, challenging problems, you should just wait until the end. Uh, if you guys have any questions during the lecture, you can just type in the chat and we'll try our best to answer. Um, we'll also be asking questions to all of you guys. So if you guys know the answer, just type it in the chat. That'd be great. Uh, if you don't have the handout right now, uh, you can check our website. It should be on there. And later after the meeting, we'll be posting homework on the website as well, if you're interested. So we'll be starting our first topic, which is arithmetic sequences and series. All right, so as it says in the handout, an arithmetic sequence is basically one where every two terms are, have a common difference. So for example, the series one, three, five, seven is an arithmetic sequence because between each term, there's a common difference of two. So more formally, if we call the nth term, let's call a term a sub n, the, an arithmetic se sequence is basically one where a sub n equals a sub n minus one plus some common difference. So we'll start off by finding a general formula for what an nth term of a sequence would be. So the first term is a sub a, let's just call the first term a. And the second term given this definition over here would just be a plus d. The third term would be a plus two d. And if we continue this pattern, we'd find the nth term is a plus n minus one times d. So, but most of competition math doesn't focus on just the sequence, but rather the sum of all the terms in a sequence. And we call that sum a series. So for example, let's say we had a series like one plus two plus three, all the way up to nine. This thing is not that hard to uh, calculate by hand, as you could simply just add up each term and you find that it equals 45. But if there are a lot larger se uh, series with a lot more numbers or larger numbers, this wouldn't work as well since simply adding wouldn't be easy. For example, let's say we have the sequence one plus five plus nine, all the way up to 61, where the common difference is four. Since we have a lot of terms, we need to find an easy way to add this. And one convenient trick that's mentioned on the handout is that we can simply reverse the uh, series. For example, if we write S equals this, we can also write the exact same series below it in a reverse order. So that would mean writing 61 plus 57 plus 53, all the way down to one. And we can notice something interesting that in each of these columns, each pair of numbers adds up to the exact same value, 62. Since as the top sequence, as the top series increases by four each time, the reverse bottom one decreases by four, so the sum is always 62. And this will make the overall thing a lot easier to add, since now we have, know that we have 16 columns and each of them adds to 62. So the total sum equals 16 times 62. And as that's for two times the series, we know that the sum of the series itself is 16 times 62 divided by two, which equals 496. Now we probably want to generalize this for to work for any sequence. So we can do this by noticing that the 62 is simply the first term plus the last term. And the 16 is the number of terms. So in general, the sum for any arithmetic se uh, series is a sub one plus a sub n times the number of terms divided by two. And this will prove to be useful in a lot of problems. So we'll start off with some relatively simple problems that can show up in a competition. So for the first problem, we basically want to uh, consider four consecutive odd integers that sum up to 256. And what would the least of those four integers be? So given that we know that there's four integers, we know that n equals four. And we can call the first integer x, which is what we're trying to solve for. 
So using the formula we just had in the previous problem, we'd find that uh, the sum equals n times x plus the final number, which is the fourth consecutive odd integer, would be x plus 6, as each odd integer has a difference of 2. So whatever net value x is, the fourth value would be x plus 6 divided by 2. Plugging in the values that we know, we can write 4 times 2x plus 6 divided by 2 equals 256. 2x plus 6 equals 128. And then finally, we simply solve an x equals 61, which would be the answer to this question. The next problem is slightly more complicated and requires a bit more thinking, too. Yeah, so our next question is a harder math counts question. So the problem is, one evening, Varun finishes reading a novel that he has been reading for several days and finds the ending so excited that he immediately begins reading the novel's sequel. Each novel has pages numbered consecutively starting with page one. Each novel has fewer than a thousand pages. If Varun reads a total of 42 pages in one sitting and the sum of the page numbers he reads in that sitting is 2018, what is the number of the last page of the first novel? So the problem gives us a lot of information. So we'll start by uh, naming some of our variables. So we'll let the number of pages in book one be x, and the number of pages in book, uh, and the number of pages he read in book one be n. So if we list out the page numbers that he read, uh, we will get the page numbers x minus n plus one, comma, x minus n plus two, comma, dot, 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 all the way to x. And these are the pages he read in book one. Since the last page is x, the number of pages in book one, and the total number of pages in this part is n. So that means the remaining 42 minus n pages that he read are from book two. So that means the rest of the page numbers are one, comma, two, comma, three, dot, 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 all the way until 42 minus n. So we see here that we have two arithmetic sequences with the common difference being one. So we could, what we could do right now is that we could just use our formula to find the sums of the two sequences and just solve for x. But that would be a lot of work because there's a lot of algebra involved and it's very easy to just make a careless mistake or just overlook something. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a little trick. So since we know both series have the same common difference, we can just subtract x minus n from uh, the earlier numbers. So or x minus 42 from the page numbers in book one. So this would get us 42 minus n plus one, then 42 minus n plus two, dot, 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 all the way until 42 minus n plus n, which is the, the same as 42. And if we look closely, if we switch the orderings of the pages in book two with book one, we get one comma two comma three dot, 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 all the way until 42 minus n, then 42 minus n plus one, 42 minus n plus two dot, 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 until 42. And this just gives us an arithmetic sequence with a common difference of one, with uh, the first term being one and the last term being 42. And we can find the sum of these numbers very easily because we know the formula. So if we take the first term and the last term, one and 42, they sum to 43 and there are 42 terms in total. So that gives us 42 times 43. And then we divide by two and that gives us our answer is 903. So that's the sum of these page numbers. But if you remember, we subtracted uh, x minus 42 earlier, and we subtracted it n times from each of the n pages we read in book one. So this means that we have to account for the n times x minus 42 pages, page numbers that we subtracted. So this plus 903 gives us what the problem gives us, 2018. So that means we know that n times x minus 42 equals 2018 minus 903, which is 1,115. So we know that n times x minus 42 is 1,115. 
So that means n has to be a divisor of 1,115. So the prime factorization of 1,115 is three times, uh, it's five times uh, 223. So since Varun only read 42 pages, n has to be less than 42 because he can't read more than 42 pages from book one. So that means n can only be one or five. And those two numbers would give us that x minus 42 is 1,115 if n was one, and it would give us 223 if n was five. So we have two pairings, one and 1,115 and two and 223. If it was the first pairing, that means we would get that x is more than 1,000 since we would get that x minus 42 is 1,115, which means that x is 1,157. And the problem clearly states that each book has less than a thousand pages, which means that our answer has to be the second pairing. And that gives us X minus 42 is 223. So that means X is 265, which is our final answer. So that's our last example for arithmetic sequences and series. Uh, now we'll move on to geometric sequences and series. So, what exactly is a geometric series? So remember earlier when we had arithmetic sequences, it would be the first term A1, and each term after that would just be A1 plus D, A1 plus 2D, and so on. So each number had a common difference. Geometric series, however, instead of having a common difference, they have a common ratio. So we have A sub one as the first term, and then the second term would be A sub one times R, and a sub two or a sub two or a sub three is a sub one times r squared. So an example of this would be one comma three comma nine comma twenty seven. Here we have that the second term three is exactly three times the first term one. The third term nine is exactly three times the second term, and so on. So our common ratio r is three in this case, and our first term a sub one would be one. So just as we did with arithmetic sequences and series earlier, we can find a general term for the nth term of an arithmetic sequence. So we remember earlier how for an arithmetic sequence, it was a plus n minus one times d. Well, in this case, we notice uh, the n minus one goes to the power of r and r is multiplied by a sub one. So this gives us our general formula of a sub one times r to the n minus one. So something special about geometric series that we can't really do with arithmetic series is that there's a special type of geometric series called an infinite geometric series. So if we look at the infinite series, one half plus one fourth plus one eighth dot 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 all the way until forever, notice how each consecutive term is exactly one half of the last term. So the common ratio is one half. The first term is also one half. So if we think about it, as we sum the numbers, if we stop, we get one half as the sum of the first number. And after the second term, if we stop, we get three fourths, then seven eighths, then 15 sixteenths, and so on. And it appears as though we get closer and closer to one, though we haven't exactly reached it. So what we can do here is, let's say we call the sum of the series S. So we have S equals one half plus one fourth plus one eighth and so on. Notice how if we divide S by two, we get that S divided by two equals one fourth plus one eighth plus one sixteenth and so on. And we see how from the second term of the sum on onwards is the same as the sum divided by two. So what we can do is we can cancel these parts out. So we get that since the one fourth from the sum and the one fourth from the sum divided by two cancel out, same for the one eighth and so on. And since this goes on forever, everything after that gets canceled out. So we get that the sum minus the sum divided by two is one half. So, that, so if we solve, we get that the sum equals exactly one. 
which is what we kind of guessed earlier when we were taking the sums at intervals. So how would we generalize this to like any infinite geometric series? So let's say we had the series a sub one plus a sub one r plus a sub one r squared and so on. And like we did with the example above, we multiply s by the common ratio one half. This gives us a sub one r plus a sub one r squared plus a sub one r cubed and so on. And we notice again how a sub one r appears in both sums and a sub one r squared appears in both sums and so does everything else onwards. So we see that if we subtract the two, all of those should cancel out. And this gives us that s minus r times s equals a sub one. So we solve for the sum s, we get that s equals a sub one over one minus r. And this only works for when the common ratio is between negative one and one, because if the common ratio was larger than that, then the sum would just be infinitely large since it would constantly be increasing. So we found a formula for the sum of an infinite geometric series. But what if we just want to find the sum for, let's say, our earlier example when we had 3, 9, 27, and so on. So we can obviously do that in our head. 3 plus 9 is 12. 12 plus 27 is 39. That's pretty easy, right? But let's say we want to sum something larger, like 3 plus 9 plus 27 plus 81 plus 243 plus 729, and so on. Well then, we can do something similar with what we did with an infinite geometric series, where we multiply the sum by the common ratio, in this case, r would be three, and we get that r times s equals, in this case, three times three would be nine, then nine times three would be 27, and then after 27, we get 81, then 243, then 729, and then finally, 2,143. So if we do the same thing as above, we take the original sum and subtract the sum times the common ratio r, we get that one minus three times the sum equals three minus 2,143. And this gives us our final answer of uh, 2,143 minus three over two, which gives us 1070. So if we generalize this to any series, we have, let's say the sum is a sub one plus a sub one r plus dot dot dot, all the way to the nth term, a sub one r to the n minus one. And we multiply this by r, we get a sub one r plus a sub one r squared dot 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 until a sub one r to the n. If we take the difference, we get s minus r times s equals since all the terms except for a sub one and a sub one r to the n get canceled out, this leaves us with a sub one from the sum minus a sub one r to the n from r times the sum. So solving for s, we get that s equals a sub one minus a sub one r to the n all divided by one minus r. So, now we'll be starting uh, our first example question for geometric sequences and series. Uh, okay, so this question is basically about playing a game with coins. So Alice and Bob are both playing a game with coins and Alice starts first. On her turn, she flips a coin and if she gets heads, she wins. Otherwise it comes Bob's turn and then he gets to flip a coin. And if he gets tails, he wins. And this game basically continues until one time wins. So what is the probability that Alice wins the overall game? So one of the easiest way to start with these kind of problems is to look at the first few cases. So on the first turn, what is the probability that Alice will win on the very first turn? Sorry, there's some technical difficulties. So since she's just flipping a coin, it would just be one half, which means that the probability on the first turn is one half. And after that, assuming Alice doesn't win on the first turn, once the, the next turn that she can win is, sorry, it's, it's technical. The probability that she wins on the, the next turn that she can win is the third turn. 
which in which basically she has to lose the first turn, Dob has to lose the second turn, and then she has to win the third turn. The probability for that happening is just one eighth. And then on the third turn, basically if she doesn't win on the third turn, her next option, I'm oh, sorry, if she doesn't win on the third turn, her, the next turn she can win is the fifth turn, which would require that Bob loses the fourth turn, and then Alice wins the first, fifth turn. So once again, as this requires her um, five turns to be fixed, this would be one over 32. And if we keep repeating this pattern, we find out that this is an infinite ser uh, series. As basically Alice can win on any odd turn, as those are the turns where she plays, and each time she has one fourth the chance of winning as the previous turn. So using the formula that we had before, s equals one half over one minus one fourth. Which, yeah, and as uh, James said in the chat, which is just equal to uh, two thirds. So Alice's probability of winning is just two thirds. Okay, so now we'll move on to the next one, which is a bit harder. Yeah, so this is another uh, harder math tense question. It's from the math tense states. So the question is, 11 boastful bees are all lined up in a row. Each bee after the first one brags that it collected one more than twice as many as grains as pollen as the bee in front of it. The first bee has 100 grains of pollen. How many grains did the last bee collect? So what we can do here is, well, we know that the first bee, let's call it B sub one, B1. B1 has 100 grains of pollen. This is what the problem told us. So given what we know from the problem, that means the second B, B2, would have two times 100 plus one, which is 201. And then from there, we would have B3 is two times 201, which is 402 plus one, which is 403. And then after that, we would have 807. And then after that, we would have 1,615. And this is getting big really quickly. So maybe doing this by hand and just writing it all out isn't the best way to do it. So what we can do instead, uh, maybe we can try setting, uh, looking at B2 and B3 and B sub N in terms of B1. So we know that B2 equals two times B1 plus one. So what would that make B2? So B sub three would be two times B2 plus one, which would be two times two B1 plus one, which is four B1 plus two plus one. So that gives us four B1 plus three. And what do you think would be after that? Yeah, so as James said, uh, it'll be 8B1 plus 7. And then after that, it'll be 16B1 plus 15. And then so on. And this matches up to what we got earlier, where we saw 807 and 1615. So we start to see a pattern. So we can clearly see that the coefficients of the B1s are 2, 4, 8, and 16. So these are clearly a powers of 2. But what's a bit harder to see is the pattern that's made by the constants we add, 1, 3, 7, and 15. So do you guys see any patterns with this? Yeah, so as James said, uh, there are 2 to the n minus 1. So we can see if we add 1 to each of them, we would get 2, 4, 8, 16, which is just the powers of 2 again. So this makes us think that maybe uh, maybe b sub n will be equal to 2 to the n minus 1 times b1 plus 2 to the n minus 1 minus 1. And when we test this out, let's say we want to find b sub n plus 1. Uh, we will multiply b sub n times 2 and then add 1. And that would give us 2 to the n b sub 1 plus 2 to the n 
minus one. So this works out. We get what we get. It shows that our guess is right. So if we want to find what the 11th B is, we want to find B11. So if we plug that in, we get 2 to 11 minus 1, which is 2 to the 10, times B sub 1, plus 2 to the N minus 1, in this case, 11 minus 1, minus 1. So this gives us 2 to the 10 B sub 1 plus 2 to the 10 minus 1, which is 1,024 times 100 plus 1,024 minus 1, which is 1,023. And this gives us 1,025,023. So that's our answer. Okay, so, sorry, skip the question. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. So uh, we'll be starting our challenge problems now. So this is our first challenge problem. This is from a uh, math counts from last year. The sequence a sub n is defined by a1 equals 20, a2 equals 19, for n is greater than, and for n is greater than or equal to three, a of n equals, a of n minus one, the absolute value of that, minus the absolute value of a of n minus two. So it asks us for the value of a of 2019. So this isn't really geometric or arithmetic, so we can't really use our formulas. But what we can do is we can just start out by listing out some of the terms. So we know that it gave us a of one is 20 and a of two is 19. So if we find a of three, that'd be 19 minus 20, which is negative one. And we continue, we get the absolute value of a of three minus the absolute value of a of two. So that would be one minus 19, which gives us negative 18. So finding the next term would be 18 minus one, which is 17. Then we get 17 minus 18, which is negative one. And then we get negative one minus 17 or one minus 17, which is negative 16. And we're kind of starting to see a pattern, maybe not quite yet, so we'll continue a bit. So what would be the next term? It would be the absolute value of 16 minus the absolute value of negative one, which would be 16 minus one, which is 15. And then after that, it would be 15 minus 16, which is negative one. And I think some of you guys can start guessing what the next term would be, just based on the pattern we see. Yeah, so as James said, it would be negative 14. And after that, it would be 13, and then negative one. So we start to see that, well, first of all, negative one appears every three terms. And then besides the negative ones, we have 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, dot, dot, dot. But some of the signs are different. We notice that aside from 20, all of the even numbers have a negative no sign, and all the odd numbers are positive, and it's just decreasing. So this should continue, right? Except what would happen if we would get zero? Because zero is a bit weird with absolute values. So if we continue this, we see that uh, the last negative one we wrote is a 12th term. So if we continue this, that means once we get to negative two, one, negative one, that should be the 28th, 29th, and 30th terms because we've repeated this process 10 times and negative one shows up every three terms. So three times 10 would be 30. So what happens next? We get that the next term, the 31st term would be, yeah, as James said, zero. So following that, we would get zero minus the absolute value of negative one, which is one, so we get negative one. And we can see this already kind of broke what our pattern was, because earlier we had negative one show up every three terms, but here we have negative one is the 32nd term, which is not a multiple of three. So that means the next following that would be one, since we have one minus zero, and then 
we see that one minus the absolute value of negative one is zero. We get zero again. And following that, we get zero minus one, which would be negative one. And we see this starts to repeat. The next term would be one, then zero, and so on. So we notice from here on out, the 33rd term is one, the 36th term is also one, and the 39th term would also be one. And these ones repeat every three times. So we know that one, uh, every multiple that is a multiple of three would be one. And we also notice that a of 2019, we have 2019 is divisible by three because if you sum all of the digits, you get two plus one plus nine, which is 12, which is divisible by three. So we know that 2019 is divisible by three. So we get A of 29 has to be one since we know all of the multiples of threes after, thir uh, after 33 are equal to one. So that gives us our final answer. A of 2019 is one. Okay, so right. our next problem is more focused on geometric uh, series specifically, and not just pattern recognition. So in this problem, we have the uh, arbitrary geometric series, a plus ar plus ar squared, and so on, has a sum of seven. But the terms involving odd powers of r have a sum of three. And we want to find what a plus r is. So we can start out by just listing out the formula that we derived earlier in the lecture. We know that the first sum equals a over one minus r, which equals seven. But we can also look at the odd powers of r, which come out to be ar plus ar cubed plus ar to the fifth, and so on. Uh, this also turns out to be a geometric series. Do you guys know? Do you guys notice what the first term is and what the common ratio would be? Yeah, ar would be the first term, and the common ratio is r squared. Exactly. So this sum would equal ar over one minus r squared, and we're given that equals three. So now from this step onwards, we can notice that the bottom is a difference of squares. Some of you guys might have learned this already, but if not, that's fine. You'll, we'll cover that in a future lecture. But a difference of squares means it can be factored as 1 minus r times 1 plus r. If you try expanding this bottom, you'd see that it comes out to 1 minus r squared, and this equals 3. But now we see something familiar in here. We see this a over 1 minus r here that we had from before. So we can rewrite this thing as 7 times r over 1 plus r equals 3. And from here, just solving for r, 7r equals 3 plus 3r, 4r equals 3, so r equals 3 fourth. But we're not exactly done with the question since there's still one more part left. Uh, we want to be able to tell what uh, a is as well. So we can go back to the original equation, uh, s1 equals a over 1 minus r equals 7. So yeah, since r equals 3 fourths, we know that a over 1 fourth equals 7, which means that a equals 7 over 4. And now our final answer is simply just adding a and r. So you get 7 over 4 plus 3 over 4 equals 5 halves. All right, so our next question is again looking for patterns in a, seri a sequence. So the sequence itself is rather uh, unusual. It consists of ones and then followed by blocks of twos, first one, two, then two twos, and so on. And we want to find out what the sum of the first uh, 1,234 terms of the sequence is. So just as we've done in uh, previous problems, what do you guys think we should start out with for this? In general, uh, if you look at smaller terms, in order to get a better idea of how the series works, we can look at the smaller terms. So uh, one convenient way, since there are blocks of two, we can try looking at uh, every block of two and the one before it. The first block of two sums to one plus two equals three. The second block of two sums one plus two plus two equals five. The third one sums seven, and so on. And we can notice that these are basically the, all the odd numbers starting from three. And that makes sense, since the common difference between each of them is two. And if the first number is three, all the others will be odd numbers as well. But uh, we, to find out how many blocks of these occur before the 1234th term, we also observe that these blocks have length two, length three, length four, and so on, all the way up to n. The total length of the blocks is two plus three plus four, all the way up to some n. And we want this to be less than 1234, since we want to see how many blocks come before 
the 1234th term. So using the formula from before, do you, uh, can one of you type out in the chat what the formula would be? Yeah, exactly. As James typed, it would be n plus two as of the first and last term times n minus one as there's one less than n terms divided by two is less than one, two, three, four. Now, at this point, it's in general, you can just guess and check your way to the answer uh, for the smallest n that works. But as we know that one, two, three, four is roughly equal to 50 squared divided by two, which is one, two, two, five. To be able to test that value is around 50. We can find that the smallest n that does work is n equals 40. Sorry, the largest n that does work is n equals 49. And this corresponds to the one, two, two, fourth term. That means the first one, two, two, four terms add up to three plus five plus seven and so on, all the way up to two times 48 plus one. And again, we can use our formula for an arithmetic sequence to get that the sum is equal to the last term, which is 96 plus one, 97 plus three times the total number of terms, which is 48 divided by two which we can easily calculate as this is just 100 to be 2,400. But now this just gives us a sum of the first uh, 1,224 terms. So we have to deal with the last 10 terms if we want the first 1,234 terms. But this is uh, the easy part of the problem as we know that there's just one one followed by a large amount of twos. So in the next turn, 10 terms, there will be a one and the, other, the rest of them will all be nines. So it's the next 10 terms all added to 19. So the total sum at the end is just 2400 plus 19 equals 2419. And as this problem was multiple choice, you could, the answer would be B. So now we'll go over one more new topic called the telescoping series. So in general, the sequence we have in front of you is pretty easy to evaluate even mentally. You don't need to really calculate the, any special techniques. So for example, you could just try counting the number of blocks that there are. And as you know, that each of the blocks sum to one. And doing so, you'd see that there, if the first block starts with four and the last block starts with uh, 2010, uh, close, it's 2006. The first block starts with four and the last block starts with 2010, that means there's actually 2007 blocks. So we could account it that way, but another way is called using te the telescope. So this problem is rather easy to do with or without telescopes. However, it's a good problem for showing how to use the telescope. So we can notice that we're at four minus three plus five minus four plus six minus five and so on. This four cancels out with this four. This plus five cancels out with this minus five and so on. And essentially every turn cancels out until when you are add plus 20, 10, minus 29. Every turn ends up canceling out except for this first minus three and this plus 2010. So our final answer simply is 2010 minus three equals 2007. Yeah, and this basically helps like avoid off by one errors because like it's pretty easy for something like this to make an off by one error. So in our homework problem, we actually have more problems on telescoping. This is a very basic example of just how a telescope works. But the main goal of telescoping is just to see, try to make terms cancel out with each other. So you're only left with a few finite number of terms in the beginning and terms in the end. And it's a lot easier to calculate in the overall. All right, so here's another uh, not exactly arithmetic or geometric sequence. So this is a pretty hard question. So the problem states, on an infinitely large grid of squares, a two by two region is shaded. Starting in the square above the upper left shaded square, the squares in the grid are numbered with consecutive positive integers moving in a clockwise direction to the next open square. The figure shows the grid with the first 18 squares numbered. What integer will be uh, appear in the sixth square to the right of the square numbered five? So here we see the square number five is right to the right of the shaded two by two. And we wanna find the square that, uh, the number that appears in the sixth square to the right. So if we look at these numbers right now, uh, we don't really see any pattern. It's sort of nonsensical. Like 
if you go straight upwards, you have 1, 14, and so on. And there's not really any like pattern that you can see. But we also see that the question states that we are not numbering the squares that are shaded in. So if we see this, we might consider that we want to number the shaded squares. So starting with the top right shaded square, we'll number that one. And then below that, we'll number it two. And then if we continue going clockwise, we'll number it three, then four, then five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, and so on. We'll continue this. And as we fill this in, we see something special about these numbers. If we compare our second grid with the first grid, we see that all the numbers in the unshaded squares in our new grid are exactly four more than the corresponding squares in the first grid. So in the first grid where there used to be a one, we, have, we now have a five, which is one plus four. Where there used to be a two, we have a six, which is two plus six. We used to have a 13, we have a 17 now, which is 13 plus four, and so on. So we notice all of these terms are exactly four more than their corresponding terms in the old grid. And this makes sense because we're basically filling it in the same pattern, except instead of starting at one in the one square, we're starting with a five since we've numbered one through four in the shaded square. So now we look at our new grid. Maybe we can find some patterns here that we didn't see before. So some numbers that stand out, we see that if you look at the diagonal starting to the one, if you go to the bottom and to the right, we have nine. And following that, if you go to the bottom and the right again, we have 25. So what's special about all of these numbers? Yeah, so as James said, they're all perfect squares. Uh, more specifically, along that diagonal, we have perfect squares of odd numbers. We have one squared, we have three squared, and we have five squared. And then along another diagonal, starting from four and going up and to the left, we have two, 16, and 36. And these correspond to two squared, four squared, and six squared. So now we were finally getting somewhere. We have like some sort of pattern that we can see. So this makes us think that maybe if we continue along these diagonals, the one to the bottom and right has all the odd perfect squares and the one to the top and left has all the even perfect squares. So we can show that this is true because if you look at when we're at the first square, it's filled in a one by one. And then if we count the first four numbers, one, two, three, four, it's a four by four square, and the four is in the top left square of the four by four. If we continue from one through nine, we have all the numbers are in a three by three square, and the number nine is in the bottom right square of the three by three. And if we continue, we see that 16, the numbers one through 16 are in a four by four square, and 16 is to the top left, 25 is in a five by five square and it's a bottom right and so on. So we know that these have to follow the rule where everything to the bottom right of one is a perfect odd square and everything to the top right of or top left of four is a perfect even square. So now we wanna find the square filled in to six units to the right of five. So what we can do is to move to the right, we can just go along our diagonal of odd powers. So the square that used to be a five is now filled in with a nine. So from there, we wanna move six squares to the right. So what we can do is we can move down the diagonal of perfect squares. So then we would move to 25. And then after 25, we would have 49. And after 49 to the bottom right, we would have 81, and after 81, we would have 121. 
and then we would have 13 squared, which is 169, and finally 15 squared, which is 225. So now we're in the same column as the number we want to find. So what we can do now is since we know how our pattern goes in like a spiral, we can just count upwards. So directly above 225 would be 224. And then if we continue upward, as Felix said, yeah, we get that the number in that square is 219, which is our final answer. Right now, it's so not a this is answer. another example of like a pattern that isn't exactly arithmetic or geometric, and it takes a bit of observations to find the pattern. Yeah, as Arul mentioned, yeah, we actually missed a step. So this 219 is the answer in the final, but this is in our new box. So right. we have to again shift back to our original box. As we have five, as in the shifted box, everything is increased by four, which means the actual final answer would be 219 minus four. 215. Yeah, that's also important. I got carried away there. Uh, yeah, so whenever you do something, just make sure you make a note of it, and it makes it easier to make sure you don't make any silly mistakes like that, because making mistakes like this is pretty easy, especially when you're on a time crunch.